one of the most powerful sentences I've, I've ever read uh, has come in a small book uh, called Prisoner in the Third Cell. And it's a semi-fictional uh, drama based on the life of John the Baptist. It's really short. You could read it in an hour. And all of it really focuses on one statement from Jesus. You may remember the scene from the Bible. It's, it's in Matthew 11 and in Luke 7. John the Baptist is in prison and he sends word to Jesus uh, through his followers saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you the, the promised one? And here's what Jesus says. He responds and says, tell John this, the blind get their sight and the lame walk and, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life. And then he ends it with this statement, and blessed is he who is not offended with me. And the book explores that question of why would John or anyone else for that matter be offended by all the good things that Jesus is doing? And, and the book draws out that yes, Many of the blind received their sight, but not all of them. And many of the deaf uh, got their hearing back, but not all of them. And yes, there were some dead that were raised to life, but not all of them. And oh, by the way, John, you sitting there in prison, you will be beheaded because of an ob obscene dance by a teenage girl. And Jesus' words to him are, blessed are you if you're not offended with me. Some people will get rescued, but not you, John. And here's the sentence in the book that struck me. Talking about John there in prison. Saying that he has come face to face with a God who does not live up to his expectations. And blessed is the one who is not offended. This morning we return again to the book of Daniel. And it opens with Daniel wrestling with this very idea. What he thought God would do, what he had planned on God doing, what he expected God to do has not happened. And so he's wrestling with, my reality and my hopes aren't matching up right now. And so he cries out to God for answers, and eventually he gets one. But again, it's not the answer he expected. And so here's how this passage flows. We're, we're in Daniel chapter 10, and Chapter 10 provides the setting. Right? Here's what was going on and here's how God provides the answer to Daniel. Then all of chapters 11 and 12 are the answer. He gives them a word or a, a vision. And because chapters 10 through 12 are all one event, I was really having a hard time dividing it up. When I originally laid everything out earlier this year, I had planned on doing um, chapters 10 and 11 this week and then chapter 12 next week. But the more I dug into it this week, I felt like we were getting lost in, in the woods. I mean, we could break it down and really spend like five weeks over these last three chapters. But, but I didn't want us to get so bogged down that we missed the point of the passage. And so instead, I'm going to cover all of it today. And you may be thinking, three long chapters today. Yes, that's what we're doing. Um, but I'm only going to summarize parts of chapter 11 uh, for reasons that I'll discuss when we get there. But here's an outline for you to follow. Uh, three main parts. Part number one, in those days. That's chapter 10, the setting. In those days, that's the heading. Part two, I'm calling now. That's essentially chapter 11. And in the third section is at that time, which is pretty much all of chapter 12. So, in those days, now, at that time. That's, that's the flow. So let's start with chapter 10, in those days. I'm going to start reading verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. And so this first verse here is basically an overview of everything that's about to happen. Daniel is saying, I received this word. I understand it now. As we'll see, he didn't understand it at the time. And everything that follows is how he came to understand it. So verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, 
As I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. Think of a, an, an emerald type jewel. His body was like beryl. His face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. So it starts off here saying that Daniel was uh, mourning for three weeks. Everything from what he ate to just freshening himself up. He, he didn't do, he was doing the bare minimum to get by. He was grieved. He was, was filled with sorrow. And so we need to say, okay, Daniel, why? Why were you mourning? Why were you grieving? And we're told all of this happened in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia which is a clue for us. Remember that the Jews have been in exile for 70 years. Um, Jerusalem was destroyed. Many of the people taken, uh, many of the people killed. The rest taken uh, by force to Babylon. And Daniel was just a teenager when that happened. And he's lived all the way through it. He's in his 80s now. And we know from the rest of the scriptures that when Cyrus became king, the, one of the first things he did in his first year was to set the Jews free. He let them go back to Jerusalem. And so during that first year, uh, the first wave of Jews went back under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And by autumn of that year, they had um, kind of cleared the destruction away from the temple area and relayed the foundation for the temple. Things were going well. But then they started facing harassment and um, opposition from the Samaritans living in the area. And the work stopped completely. And it, and it didn't start back again for 15 years. So that all started in the first year of Cyrus. Now Daniel here is hearing of the trouble. And he's in the third year of Cyrus. So he's hearing things aren't going like they were supposed to. Then we're given another clue in verse 4 that says it was the 24th day of the month, of the first month. And so he started uh, mourning and kind of going through a semi-fast three weeks before this. Now it's the 24th. And during that time would have been Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So put your mind in Daniel's. I mean, we'll try to, right? Try to put your mind in Daniel's. The people had been let go, but he wasn't with them. In fact, a lot of people weren't with them. Um, they, they went back to the land in waves. And this first wave wasn't, wasn't that big. Maybe they were waiting for some of the work to be completed. Maybe they were just comfortable. We don't know. But God's promise had come to pass. The um, exile in Babylon was over. The people were free. But there was opposition. There was harassment. Persecution. Persecution. The work wasn't getting done. And here is Daniel back in Babylon celebrating Passover, which remember was all about the exodus, right? God's people being set free from bondage in Egypt to allowed to go into the promised land. Now he's living with the reality that this exodus, the people being set free from bondage back to the land, was not going the way that it was supposed to. So he's in mourning. And suddenly a visitor shows up. And it's an angel, and the, and the people uh, with Daniel don't see it, but they even get freaked out just by the presence of the angel, and they, they all run away in fear. And Daniel sees it, and it says that his, his color changes, and then he hears the angel speak, and he passes out. <laughs> and what we see next is three different interactions with Daniel and this angel, and the, the angel wakes up Daniel, and and starts to speak to him again. But as soon as he does, Daniel can't handle it. And so the angel reaches out and touches Daniel again and, and talks some more. And Daniel still can't handle it. Then the angel touches him a third time and gives him the vision. So look at verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 10. 
And behold, a, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For this vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me. I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains and no breath is left in me. And again, one having the appearance of man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go up, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. I remember reading this passage as a new believer, and, and many times since then, and you're just like, whoa. The angel tells Daniel, that very first day you started praying, three weeks ago, I was dispatched. I was sent out to come and tell you what's going to happen with your people in the future. But I wasn't able to come right away. There was opposition. The, the prince of Persia fought against me, and I battled him for three weeks and wasn't able to really get some ground until Michael came and, and helped me out so I could give you the message. And I got to get back to the fight, but before I do, let me give you the message. And Daniel's eyes are open to this incredible spiritual reality that's happening alongside world events. And I don't want us to get caught up in <clears throat> demonology or, or the, the study of angels because I don't want us to miss the point of the passage. But what we see here is there was a spiritual war that was raging. Angels fighting demons. And from this text, we see that it wasn't random. Certain angels were dispatched to certain areas and countries where they do battle against demonic reigns. But it's not simply that, okay, well, there's our physical world and then the spiritual world and, and things happen in our world and things happen in their world, but they don't really overlap. No, in fact, we see the opposite. There's an intertwining of the spiritual and the physical that happens all the time. And that's why the angel's talking to Daniel. We see the same thing in the New Testament, right? In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is talking about what life was like before Christ. And remember he says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, who is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Uh, he says in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is an ongoing spiritual warfare. And I don't just mean us against sin. I mean, yes, that's true, but but there are both angelic and demonic forces that are at work intertwining in our daily lives, particularly as we're about to see in the realms of government and authority. We see that again in chapter 11, verse 1, where this angel tells Daniel, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. 
Darius, remember, is the Babylonian name given to Cyrus. And so the angel is saying, I helped strengthen him to get his throne. I helped to confirm him, possibly even to let the Jews go back. More on that in a moment. But, but I do want to make sure we understand this. While there is a spiritual battle that is raging right now, not just a battle, there's a spiritual war that is raging right now. It's not as though you have, you know, God in the blue corner and Satan in the red corner and they're equal combatants fighting. No, no, no. Scripture says that God just needs to utter one word and Satan is done forever. And one word and all the demonic hordes are gone. Which brings a question. Why hasn't God done that? I mean, if it's true that God just has to utter one word and Satan and the demons are gone forever, why won't God go ahead and say that word? It's because God has a plan. And his plan involves allowing Satan and demons to operate within certain confines, right? Satan's on a leash. But God allows it because it serves a greater purpose. But for now, we're going to put a, a pin in that purpose. We'll come back to it later. But first, let's get back to this issue of spiritual forces at work, particularly in the realms of, of government and authority. And this is moving us into the second major section for us today, the now section. In chapter 11, the angel tells Daniel about changes in government and world powers that were about to happen. And I'm only going to summarize parts of chapter 11 because it's what we've been looking at the last few weeks. Even though those were different visions and different dreams, they cover the same material. So in verse 2, the angel says there's going to be four Persian kings after Darius. In verses 3 and 4, we see a warrior king from Greece arises and takes over everything. And, and we know that to be Alexander the Great, who was able to pretty much do whatever he wanted. But then he dies, verse 4, his kingdom is, is split into four sections with his generals given um, dominion over those, and they set up pretty much uh, four mini dynasties. And the rulers of these sections, particularly the Seleucids in the north, which is Syria today, the Ptolemies in the south, which is Egypt, um, they fight against each other for generations. And that's verses 5 through 20 of 11. Then in verse 21, a contemptible person arises, and, and all the way through verse 35, we see his campaigns and the terror that he unleashes upon the people in the area. And this is Antiochus Epiphanes that we've looked at a few different times, who uh, eventually attacks Jerusalem, outlaws Judaism, uh, builds an altar to Zeus inside the temple, and sacrifices a pig in the Holy of Holies. Um, and some of his activities are detailed here, again, 200 years before it happened. And the point behind this cataloging of future events where the angel tells Daniel, here's, about, here's what's about to happen, is A, just to tell Daniel what's going to happen, but B, to remind him that none of it is random. World powers take over other world powers. Kings get killed. Countries and armies move. Babylon conquers Jerusalem, Medo-Persians come and take over the Babylonians, Greece comes and takes over the Persians, Rome comes over and takes over everything. And all of that happened with both physical and spiritual components, right? Alexander the Great was a brilliant commander who was also aided spiritually. Now, demonic or angelic, we don't know. And it was probably unbeknownst to him. But it all happened according to God's will and God's plan. And the reason this is important is because we need to avoid two extremes when it comes to reading history, both biblical history and our history. The first extreme is that, hey, look, man, God is sovereign. God is in control. Therefore, it doesn't really matter what we do. I mean, if God wanted the Seleucids to have control over Israel, then the Ptolemies, then so be it. Nothing they could do about it. And yes, God is sovereign, but we need to remember that the events were still happening in real time by real people who were really responsible for their actions. I mean, they faced the consequences for what they did. 
And so there is this belief on one end of the spectrum, um, this this uh, a belief in the sovereignty of God called fatalism, which just says everything is scripted out and you and I are powerless to do anything about it. Even our responses are planned by God. So eh, whatever happens, happens, whatever. Now that's an unbiblical extreme. I mean, yes, God is in control. The book of Job even says like, like even the, the, the channel, the, the path that a raindrop takes was planned by God. Yes, God is sovereign, but that sovereignty does not take away our freedom or our responsibility for our actions or the consequences that we should face. And so scripture's clear that if a government or if a person does evil, God will bring a reckoning. God will bring justice. And no one will be able to say, well, God's sovereign. God made me do it. The other extreme, however, is to say that history happens and God's just an observer. He's, it's a, it's a type of deism that said, well, God kind of created the world, got it started, but now he just sits back and, and watches. He's not actually involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the world. And that's not biblical either. And so what we're forced with this passage, uh, what we're forced with in this passage is the truth that God is sovereign. He is in charge. And there are spiritual forces at work, particularly over the changing of world powers. When Daniel sees the future glimpse that Persia will end, Greece will come, Rome will come, he's meant to see that none of that's random. Which is a much needed reminder for us today. I mean, let's take these truths from Daniel and apply them to, to our recent election. There were and are spiritual forces at work, both angelic and demonic. And by the way, we need to be very careful about assigning which one is angelic and which one is demonic. I'm not convinced that the spiritual powers at work in our world today fall neatly among party lines. The spiritual war goes deeper than red or blue. Do you know why this past election and really all elections are so dangerous? Because there is an enemy of God and an enemy of God's people who want you to feel frustrated and helpless. The enemy wants you to feel like God doesn't care about you. He wants you to doubt God's power and God's protection. The enemy wants you to feel scared and alone. As if, okay, yeah, sure, God may pick who's president, but you're left alone in the aftermath to deal with whatever comes. Or, or if your party wins or won, the enemy wants you to feel proud and arrogant, to feel like you're in control. And sure, may God, God may pick who's in charge, but... But really, the truth is, we're just better than them. That's how the enemy wants you to feel. Either way, the devil wants you to doubt God. And what we see in this text, and what's really causing Daniel to freak out, and what we need to grasp is this. Not only did God know what was going to happen, it was all part of his plan. And we really need to catch this, because this is where our faith meets the road, right? I and mean, if we walk by faith, this is, we, we've got to know this. Remember, Daniel was in mourning because life wasn't happening the way it was supposed to. The people were supposed to be back. The kingdom of Israel was supposed to be set. All the, all the captives were supposed to be freed. The, they were supposed to go back into the land, boom, the, the foundation was set, the temple was rebuilt, the walls were up, people moving back in their homes, and life was supposed to be gravy. And now, three years in, and it's all falling apart, if it got started at all. And in this vision, Daniel finds out, not only are things bad, but they're going to get worse. It'll get worse for the Jews. Greece... Four kingdoms, Rome, they really don't get back their sovereignty. They get it in, glip, in, in glimpses, really not until the end of World War II. 
But the angel also gives Daniel this message. And not only was it going to get worse for the Jews, it's also going to get worse for us. Like, I mean us today. Look at what happens in verse 36. So, uh, 11, 1 through 35 talks about what happened um, primarily in that area of the world uh, through, up through Christ. But in verse 36, we see another leader coming. He's called the king of the north. And what happens in verse 36 is the angel jumps forward in time. He was talking about the events before Christ, but here he jumps into the future. And we know that because of two things. First, the descriptions that he gives that we're about to read, none of them have happened yet. And second, they line up with descriptions elsewhere in, uh, in Scripture that we see of the Antichrist. And so let's look at it, verse 36. Chapter 11, verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen with ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and, and all the precious things of, Il, uh, of Egypt and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. and He shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help. It seems like every generation has its own idea of who this antichrist is. Most recently, quite a few people believed it to be Hitler. And while Hitler was evil, and while he was probably a lower A type of antichrist, um, the real one hasn't come yet. And we know that because of verse 12. I'm sorry, chapter 12. But before we read it, I want to make sure, kind of reset the context here. Um, Daniel has this mourning, his anxiety, due to the fact that though the Jews were allowed to go back into the land, it wasn't going well. And as I said at the beginning, Daniel's coming face to face with a God who does not meet his expectations. He thought, okay, this is what's going to happen, and it kind of happened that way. I mean, not really. Right? The temple wasn't finished, barely started. Walls around Jerusalem, not built, constant dangers. The people being harassed daily. Many of them were still in Babylon. What was going on? And the next point the angel drives home is this. God had a plan for redemption that was much bigger than the Jews getting back their land. That was the main point that was being driven home to Daniel. God had a plan of redemption that was much bigger than the Jews getting restored to the land. And this is the third and final section for us this morning at that time. At that time, the, the Antichrist will be wreaking havoc and furiously tries to destroy everyone against him and is largely successful. And yet, he's not all-powerful. His reign does come to an end. And chapter 12 picks up the end of his reign. Let's look at it. Daniel chapter 12. At that time shall arise Michael, the great priest, the, uh, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there should be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. 
But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood on the bank of the stream, and one on, one on this bank of the stream, and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from that time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. It's revealed to Daniel that there is a redemption coming that is bigger than Israel's restoration to the land. This Antichrist is bent on destruction. And there will be persecution and suffering that will be worse than anything this world has seen. There is coming a persecution that will be worse than anything this world has ever seen. Which, just take a second and think about that. Hitler killed 6 million Jews, 17 roughly million other, uh, total. This coming persecution will be worse. Joseph Stalin killed 23 million people during his reign. This coming persecution will be worse. Between 1943 and 1976, Mao Zedong in China killed 78 million people. And this coming persecution will be worse. And I don't simply mean the number of people who were killed. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But the weight and the ferocity and the intensity of the Antichrist persecution against God's people will be unlike anything the world has ever seen. Which means that we need to be ready. Not because the Antichrist will come in our lifetime. I mean, he may. He may. But until he does come, things will not get better. I mean, since Daniel's vision... Back in 336 BC, things have continually gotten worse. Even in times when the church supposedly had vast empires, people were still persecuted for their faith. The world has shown itself to be a dangerous place for the followers of God. I mean, Jesus himself says, if you follow me, you will be hated. I mean, Jesus himself says, if you follow me, it may split up your family. Brother will betray brother unto death. Mother, father. Following Jesus can get you fired. Get you imprisoned. Get you killed. The apostle Peter says, don't be surprised when the persecution and suffering come. Like it's something strange. You should expect it. The Apostle Paul is clear, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. And every generation since Christ has proven that to be true. But here's what's happened in America over the last hundred years or so. We have not experienced the same kind of persecution that our forefathers have. 
And I use that language intentionally. Our forefathers spiritually, both Christians throughout time and space, and our forefathers here in America. Before America was a country, when they were still the colonies, you had Baptists being drowned for their faith. The very reason Rhode Island was started was because of a disagreement over doctrine. Roger Williams was kicked out of Massachusetts and not allowed in. He couldn't live there. Why? It was persecution. And we think that we have not experienced the same kind of persecution in the last few hundred years as our spiritual forefathers and physical forefathers because we think that we're better than them. We're more sophisticated. We're enlightened. We've thought of that if we can make other countries like America, then they too will stop their hatred of Christians and peace will rule the earth. But it seems like the opposite is happening. More and more America is starting to resemble countries that hate God. And what I want us to get this morning is two things. First, things will get worse. Whether the Antichrist comes or not, persecution and suffering will happen. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, why do we expect to be called something better? Jesus says if you're going to follow him, you have to take up your cross, take up your execution device and follow him. Scripture promises persecution. History shows an ever-increasing hostility and persecution towards Christians, and we have to be ready for it. So how do we get ready? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. How do we get ready? We put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the evil in that day. We, we fasten on the belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as, as shoes for our feet, the, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We... In all circumstances, we take up our shield of faith with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Our helmet of salvation. We, we take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the entire time we're praying. That's how we get ready. That's the first thing I want us to get. It's going to get worse. Here's the second thing I want us to get. It's going to get worse and it's all part of God's plan. None of the persecution that is happening now all throughout the world and none of the persecution that's coming for us is random. It's not as though God is saying, I wish I could stop these people. It's all part of God's plan. God's doing something. And the something that he is doing is he is bringing about a day when all suffering will end. Persecution will stop. Jesus will come back. And we see echoes of Revelation 21 here in Daniel 12. Or maybe we see, maybe flip that. We see echoes of Daniel 12 and Revelation 21. Either way, what we see is God's people will be delivered. You see, God has this book. And in this book is a list of names. All the children of God are listed in it. Throughout every generation, and on that day, everyone's name who's written in the book will be raised to everlasting life. And those who are not in the book will be raised to everlasting contempt, destruction, hell. And what we're meant to see is here at the end of Daniel is not to get caught up in the number of days and when and how it's, it's all going to happen. That's why the angel tells Daniel twice, go on your way. It's going to happen in God's time. He has it planned, but, but you go on your way. We see something similar when, when Jesus um, ascends into heaven in, in the book of Acts. Remember the apostles say, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? And he says, it's not for you to know times or seasons. You need to be about the work. And the job that he has given us is to tell people about the glory, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Why hasn't God spoken the word and put all the angels, uh, all the demons uh, down? 
Why hasn't God brought about the end so that the persecution stops? It's because he still has people he wants saved. There are people in the book who have not yet heard and they need to hear. And the only way they will hear is if we speak to them. And so our job as Christians is not to be overly concerned by what the government is doing and when and where and why and how all of that happens. Our concern is to preach the gospel to everyone. And you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be eloquent with your words. You don't have to have all the answers. All you need is the word of God, which we have. And you need the Holy Spirit of God, which he gives to every believer. And then all you need is a willingness to open up your mouth. I've seen this done so many ways. I, I was in um, Singapore once, and, and uh, uh, this, I was with a group, and, and we were on this public tour, and this guy in our group just leans over to the, next, uh, the man next to him and says, what is your name? My name's Steve. What's your name? And he says, oh, it's a British name, Montague or something. He says, oh, that name sounds important. Is that name written in the book of life? <laughs> and from there, he jumped into the gospel. That was amazing. It's so simple. So simple. All we need is a willingness to just talk because God is the one who's responsible for the outcome. We don't have to convince anyone to come to Jesus. We just need to plead with them to come to Jesus and he changes their hearts. We don't need to convince anyone intellectually to accept the truths of scripture. All we need to do is give them the truths of scripture and God changes their minds and their hearts because the problem isn't that they haven't been convinced correctly. The problem is they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And the way they come alive in Christ is when we speak this word and the Holy Spirit uses that to energize them and give them faith. All we have to do is tell people about the greatness and glory of God. He made the world. He rules it. He cares for us. And the reason there's still evil in the world is because God is still saving evil people, forgiving them of their sins, bringing them, uh, giving them his righteousness. And when we share that message in the face and in the midst of persecution, it shows a dying world what life looks like. And it shows a dark world what light looks like. And so we call on people to repent and to turn from their wickedness and to turn to God and receive his mercy. And we do that until Christ comes back. We do that in the midst of persecution. We do that if an antichrist does come and start destroying everything. We keep preaching Christ until he comes back. And when will that be? Jesus tells us, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We preach the gospel to everywhere, everyone, everywhere, and then the end will come. Which is an encouragement to us. We have work to do. There are people who are dying in their sins who need to hear the truth of Jesus. So let's go. Let's tell them.